Hello, my name is Graham George. I am a professor at the University of Saskatchewan. I have been using synchrotron radiation since 1982 when I was a graduate student, and I've been coming to SSRL since 1983. So um, I don't know how many experiments I've done of SSRL, but it's a great many. Um, I've been asked to introduce SSRL to you today. This is a challenging task because there are many aspects to it. Um, so I'm going to begin and by giving you sort of an overview, quite literally. So this is an aerial view of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, nowadays called SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, and in fact, I think it's a view from space. Um, the, the whole place is dominated by the linear accelerator, which is this two mile long structure here. Um, and you can see it runs under the 280 freeway. So the SLAC campus is quite large. It extends over about 0.7 square miles. And it's in West Menlo Park, for those of you who've not been there. And it was established quite a long time ago, 1962, which was to build the linear accelerator here. The SPHERE storage ring, which uh, that stands for Stanford Positron Electron Accelerator Ring, used to be called asymmetric ring years ago, but that's changed now, um, became the source for SSRL in a parasitic mode in 1974. So it's the first hard X-ray synchrotron source in the world, um, although not the first dedicated source. It didn't become dedicated synchrotron radiation until the early 90s. Um, and it's over here. It's a relatively small part of the campus. And you can see the sort of oval shaped building here. I think I've got, uh, if I, here you can see it outlined in red briefly there. Um, anyway, the Spear storage ring um, has been operating since about there, but there's been several different incarnations of Spear within the tunnel. And in fact, in 2003, um, the construction of Spear 3 began. Um, and that's the ring that's currently in there now. Um, SLAC boasts six Nobel Prizes to its name, um, which is more than many universities. Three of these are in physics, and two of these physics Nobel Prizes actually used SPEAR when it was dedicated to high energy physics research. Three are in chemistry using synchrotron radiation and SSRL, and also used SPEAR. I want to put things in context just a little bit. These physics Nobel Prizes are monumental efforts. I remember, I think, the second or third visit to SSRL. I'm flying out from the United Kingdom, and I'm sitting next to another researcher, and he's a high energy physicist, and he's coming to Slack, and he's got a manuscript that he's working on. Literally, the first three pages of this manuscript were names of authors. My point in telling this story is that, um, and this was a paper manuscript back in those days, he's marking it up with a pen. Um, my point in telling this is that, is that the teams involved are huge and the amounts of effort that go into the research involving high energy physics is absolutely monumental. Um, and it's combined efforts of very large numbers of physicists, of engineers, of administrators, of all kinds of people, of machinists, of talented, uh, uh, talented technicians of every type. And I have the greatest respect for, for, for these pieces of work. And it's, it's foolish to consider them um, a trivial endeavor, let's put it that way, um, because they certainly are not. So the, these, uh, these three physics Nobel Prizes in high energy physics are, are fantastic achievements um, involving hundreds and hundreds of people. Anyway, um, we're here to talk about SSRL, so I won't, I won't get sidetracked anymore with uh, the rest of Slack, although the rest of Slack has a great deal of interest going on there too. Um, and if you look at um, this red, rectangle here. I've got this shown in higher resolution in the next slide. Um, I'm not quite sure. Here we go. Okay. And you can see that's that same rectangle, but um, 
no no longer taken from well, actually it might be taken from space. Um, but anyway, it shows it shows Esther Sorel. Um, Esther Sorel has a, a number of active experimental stations and the count keeps changing. Some things are being mothballed because of financial issues and things like that, and there are new uh, stations being bought online all the time. But basically the outline or the footprint of the whole facility is this is the this is the experimental hall that goes around the ring. When I first came, there were just two buildings, one here and, and kind of one over here. Um, the uh, this is this wasn't here when I first came. This is a booster synchrotron um, that uh, contains a three section linear accelerator, a little short one. That's where the electrons originate, and they're accelerated inside this thing and peeled off and sent inside the storage ring um, where they circulate. The, uh, and tangentially to the storage ring, there are a number of beam lines that emerge inside these experimental halls. Um, and you, if you ever go to SSRL, you'll see these. <coughs> if I stop to cough, please forgive me. I'm still testing positive for COVID-19 and I've been incarcerated in self-isolating in my study at home here. For what seems like forever, although it's only a matter of days. Um, but anyway, um, so the beam lines emerge tangentially from from around the the storage ring here. Um, the current that flows in the storage ring is about 500 milliamps of electrons. That's about the same as a handheld flashlight. So that puts it but into perspective. However, there's the, the electrons are a lot more energetic than those flowing in your flashlight. And consequently, the, uh, the photons have quite different properties. Anyway, um, I, I don't think it's my task to talk to you about the physics of things, but um, SSRL research generates around, it's one of five US Department of Energy, Basic Energy Sciences funded uh, X-ray light sources nationally in the US. And it generates about 700 publications every year. The research done at SSRL ranges from medicine to life sciences to the environmental sciences to advanced materials. It encompasses things that uh, are quite literally going to save us from ourselves. Um, I think the, 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 the advanced materials research done at SSRL, for example, um, and other places, is laying the groundwork for a, a low carbon future without fossil fuels. New materials for energy storage, new materials uh, for transformative approaches to computing, new materials for digital storage, new ultra high density digital storage media. All of these things use synchrotron radiation or, or synchrotron light, if you want to call it that. And SSRL plays a, a significant role in terms of laying the groundwork for that future. It's hard to overemphasize the importance of some of the research that's being done at this facility and the others, of course. So this is a little bit closer view of the laboratory buildings themselves. And I'm not expecting you to be able to read this text. This is taken off of the SSRL website, but it's a beamline map. And it shows where it's slightly out of date. I believe, for instance, 7.1 has uh, currently been mothballed. Um, uh, and, but basically, it shows you where the various beam lines are and the various insertion devices and sources of light. 1.5 is not an insertion device, for example. That's a bend magnet. That's another bend. And then uh, we, have, um, we have the beam lines coming out uh, tangentially around the ring as you go around it. Uh, and at the end of these beam lines here are experimental stations of various kinds. And my, my plan is to take you through just a sampler of experimental stations. Inevitably, I'm gonna offend people because um, I, I have to miss somebody's favorite beam line out no matter what I do. Um, but anyway, you'll see, uh, you'll see a little bit of um, the, the flavor of research that can be done using some of the SSRL beam lines. Here is a, a, um, my best list. Um, it's not an official list by any means. It's one that I wrote down this morning. Um, and uh, 
it's a list of the different beam lines. And this kind of emphasizes the point that I really cannot go through all of them, not in the 20 minutes that I'm supposed to complete this thing. Um, some of these beam lines uh, will not operate concurrently. For instance, the beam line 6 cluster com uh, is comprised of um, 62A, which is X-ray emission uh, spectroscopy, which um, you can you can do tender X-ray emission. It's one of the very few places worldwide that you can do this. Um, and you can do it on things like solutions at atmospheric uh, pressures and things like that. So it's kind of an unusual uh, capability. Um, 62A has that tender X-ray spectrometer. This thing weighs close to six or 700 pounds, has to be lifted and put in by forklift at the beginning of the time allotted for those experiments. And these beam lines can't operate when that's in place. Likewise, um, 62C contains the transmission X-ray microscope, which is another heavily oversubscribed capability. Um, and there's, a, there's no X-ray emission spectrometer uh, in 62A and set up in 62B. Um, uh, instead, there's a beam pipe bolted through and giving light just to the TXM. I ought to say that they are trying to streamline the changeover between things and maybe automate it so it can be moved instead of with a forklift with motors to one side when uh, when they're transitioning from one experiment to the next. Um, but this cluster of beam lines um, is um, unusual in a sense because most of the beam lines that have are on the same branch here, beam line 14, for example, which is a bend magnet. They can run concurrently. Similarly, beam line 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, and 2, 3 all run concurrently. So 2, 1 is material science X-ray diffraction, powder X-ray diffraction. 2, 2 is an XES catalysis beam line. Um, 2, 3 is an X-ray fluorescence imaging beam line that has a, a whole range of different applications. And all of these run simultaneously. You, you don't need to turn one off to run the other. Likewise, beamline 7 and beamline 4. Both of these are powered by flat top field profile wigglers that produce a very broad fan of radiation. And each of the three beamlines can take a, a slice of that beam. Or one takes the, the, uh, the inside slice. Um, for two takes, it's biological small angle X-ray scattering. That takes the the center part of the beam coming out, the best bit. And 4.3 takes uh, the kind of outside slice of the beam, uh, the, the fan of radiation coming out of this insertion device. And that's tender X-ray XAS. OK, enough about uh, the, uh, beam lines for the moment. Let's give you some specific examples. So the first in my beamline sampler, the first choice, is beamline 10-1. Beamline 10-1 is a side station on beamline 10-33 pole 1.27 Tesla Wiggler. So this beamline actually um, emerges on the SSRL side of the fan, and there's a mirror that deflects it, I think, underneath, or maybe above, I can't remember. But it, it crosses over, and then it, it comes out on the inside, on the spear side. Uh, of, the, of the beam line 10. So this is beam line 10 2 over here, this, this hutch wall here. And this is a, um, a radiation proof enclosure to keep users and, and uh, photons apart. For soft x-ray facilities, we don't need those because the, the soft x-rays won't travel in air. So it's relatively um, safe to just have a vacuum chamber. Plus, they're wiped out by air. So you need something like a vacuum chamber. Um, this whole area here that's covered in aluminum foil is, uh, is basically the, the, uh, the, the sample environment for beamline 10, uh, 10 one. And uh, it's high vacuum. Um, and there's a whole host of different type of experiments that are supported on this beamline. <clears throat> Everything from biological sciences to environmental sciences, catalysis, condensed matter and material science um, and many more probably. Um, uh, uh, experiments are carried out by users in all of these areas. And what's special about it? Well, this thing, the TES detector, 
a transition edge sensor detector. I believe this was the first one uh, operating worldwide and uh, it is a fantastically high energy resolution detector that gives you really transformative capabilities. I think there are at least two or three others, at least one of which is at SSRL. I think the other one at the moment is uh, like this, uh, is, uh, is actually at NSLS2. Um, anyway, this system is, is uh, very well automated and a high throughput uh, type XAS setup. You can set up your scans. You have a, a sort of sample stick, a rectangular sample stick, and you can load lots of samples on this and you set up your experiment to go from one sample to the other. And once it's all set up, you just let it go and you just watch the data roll in and work it up and so, you know, and observe interesting things about the spectra. So there's a high degree of automation here, and it's actually a pleasure to use once, once the thing's taking data. Beamline 10.1, soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy, 250 electron volts to 1,200 electron volts. And that would include things like the L edges of the first transition elements. Okay, moving on. Um, SSRL 12.1 is my next choice for my beamline sampler. This is a brand new beamline. It was actually commissioned during the early part of the COVID-19 lockdown. So this was a, a no mean task in itself, right? It's a, it, a challenging to do in under conditions where you couldn't work with people or at least not side by side with people. And, uh, and um, it was commissioned to do research on COVID-19. A large percentage of the structures published on, especially in the early days, on the SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, various therapies came from SSRL. So it's, a, it's certainly a, um, a fabulous facility. It has... <clears throat> Um, a lot of structures already, hundreds of structures already to its name. Not all of them are involve the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Here's my cartoon of a, of a SARS-CoV-2 virus. And this is actually the structure of the protease published this year or reported this year. Um, and uh, it serves basically biological and biomedical sciences and its structural molecular biology, macro molecular crystallography. So, uh, so it's a, a general purpose macromolecular uh, crystallography beamline. Special aspects are it is automated and remote access. All SSRL's beamlines, protein crystallography beamlines, are remote access capable. And uh, in fact, the idea of remote access originated uh, at uh, SSRL crystallography beamlines. So SSRL was doing it before other people were. Um, and this beamline has uh, um, unique microfocus optics and is capable of doing a multi-wavelength anomalous diffraction, uh, which is a method of phasing, of, of challenging the new structures, and single wavelength anomalous diffraction, another method of phasing of new structures. So it's a fantastic beamline, one of the best at SSRL. I'm part of the beamline 12 cluster, 12.1 and 12.2, are side by side and they're operated independently by two different undulator sources. So beamline 12, crystallography, microcrystals, another special aspect, not mentioned here for some reason, I should put that in. Next on my sampler is uh, beamline 15.2. Um, I've, I've taken the liberty of putting a couple of covers from earlier this year um, uh, of publications that we've had, uh, my group, um, in uh, from this beamline. Actually, it's from this beamline and from the same hardware that was based on 6.2 before it was moved to 15.2. 15.2 is a, a brand new beamline, effectively. Um, it has all kinds of capabilities. It can do um, what's called Herford XAS, which is one of the, the techniques that I like to use. Um, this is a Hereford spectrum, so high energy resolution fluorescence detected. And you can see the conventional XAS, this blue line, uh, which lacks detail, it's sort of smeared out. And the Hereford XAS is beautifully peaky and sharp, and you can see all kinds of detail. And so you can see much more with the red 
line, then you can with a blue line, and that's kind of the point. Um, and uh, basically, um, research is all over the place here as well, all kinds of different areas of research. Life sciences, environmental sciences, uh, we're interested in heavy metal toxicology, um, advanced materials, catalysis, electrochemistry, all kinds of different things. They have uh, a number of high resolution spectrometers uh, for users to use in the beamline, including things like an X-ray Raman setup. Um, they have the capability of biological sample handling, liquid helium cryostats and such like. They have time resolve capabilities, X-rays plus a laser. They have, um, uh, they can fit uh, high pressure capabilities into the hutch. They have microfluidics and the list goes on. So I, I'm not going to try and cover everything. I can spend all of the time just talking about Beamline 15.2. Then there's 7.3. 7.3 is a 20-pole flat-top field profile wiggler, so it's part of the Beamline 7 cluster. It, uh, it, uh, it it's, has a double crystal monochromator, pressurized liquid nitrogen cooled, and it operates from 5,400 to 32 keV. It has research going on life science, environmental sciences, biomedical science, type of air, I should say medical, chemistry, and uh, various other things. And its special aspects, we have liquid helium cryostats here as standard, and we have a, um, a large X-ray beam, which you think may be something undesirable, but actually for some samples, those subject to photo damage or X-ray photo damage, um, that's very important capability. So things that tend to photo reduce in the X-ray beam, you often can't observe them on a focus beam line, such as beam line 9.3, for example, uh, and you need to go to 7.3 to look at them. So this is an important capability, and now I've taken the liberty of sticking another cover from earlier this year. Um, uh, from This is primarily studies uh, using BMI 7.3. Um, okay. 5.4 is the next in my sampler. This is uh, material um, borrowed from a publication by ZX Shen's group in nature earlier this year. And uh, this is an angle resolved photo emission beamline. Um, the research done here um, includes condensed matter and uh, condensed matter physics and advanced materials. Uh, interesting things like quantum topological materials that uh, really probably will produce the next generation of advanced devices. It has um, uh, very high energy, ultra high resolution photo emission. And as I mentioned, these advanced materials have real transformative capabilities, and it's hard to overstate their importance for our future. Beamline 7.2, X-ray fluorescence imaging, a micro beam, and you can move it, move the sample around to interrogate different parts of it. These images are actually taken from the same hardware that was moved from Beamline 10.2 over to 7.2. Um, 7.2 research encompasses the environmental sciences, life science research and material sciences. Um, and uh, and um, its special aspects are large sample scanning. So you can, so for example, some of my colleagues, I've seen them being the, scanning an entire section of human brain. So a coronal section all the way across, and they've been able to scan an entire image in neurodegenerative type diseases to look for changes in the various metals in the brain. Um, you can see some sample images here. These are actually 10-2 images. I, I don't yet have any 7-2 images of, of our own. This is a, um, a, a plant leaf, and this is a, a, a tiny little freshwater fish that, that grew up in a selenium contaminated stream, taken from the wild, and so on and so forth. So. This will give you information about what metals might be present in environmental samples, for example, or in life science research or biomedical research. And finally, I'm a little bit over time, so I will, go, I will close soon. Um, there are all these great capabilities, all this fantastic infrastructure at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, but so far I haven't mentioned what I believe to be the most important of these, and that's the staff. 
SSRL's staff are its biggest asset. There is um, a, a great sense of community at SSRL, and I really enjoy working in there for that reason. Uh, I, there was a duty operator whom I miss called Tom Hostetler, and whenever we would come back to SSRL, doesn't matter where I was coming from, whether it was New Jersey or whether it was um, whether it was from Saskatchewan or wherever, various places I've been throughout my career, Tom would say, welcome home. And that's kind of how it feels. More important than that, everybody is aligned on making your experiment work and work the best that it possibly can. Doing that safely and effectively and not wasting any photons and carrying the project through to productive scientific results, which is all of our goal in, in, in using facilities such as this. So that's my um, two cent uh, introduction to SSRL. Um, I hope you enjoy using SSRL as much as I have enjoyed using it. Thank you.